Good morning, everyone. Come in, come in and sit down, or come in and sit on the sofa, or come in and pull up a chair, or a rocking chair, wherever you may be. You may be in bed with a laptop on you. Hey, wherever. It is good to have you worshiping with us on a beautiful morning in the summertime here in Sealy's Bay. Thank you for taking time to be a part of this with us. Here once again in 3D with Don and Dave and Dan to bring you this worship service today. We do have some announcements for us. We have done very well and it is thanks to the people of this pastoral charge and of the churches on the charge uh, who continue to, to do wonderful work as they have continued to be faithful and, and dedicated to the church throughout this uh, unusual time that we are living in. But uh, some results have come in from the chicken barbecue back on July 17th. Almost $1,500 was realized from the barbecue, so that is just excellent. We sold out the, the 200 some chickens that we were, half chickens that we were looking to, to sell, so that's amazing. And then just yesterday, we had a car trunk sale at Centennial Park for the pastoral charge, and that raised almost $1,400. So just remarkable efforts. So thank you so much to Monique for spearheading that and for all those who participated. We can keep the momentum going as we are still within a series of fundraisers throughout the summer. Next week is the long weekend already at Civic Holiday. Uh, in Ontario, so July the 31st in the morning there will be a bake sale across from Kelly's from the Fresh Mart at uh, the home of Carol and Mel Johnson. So do uh, make an effort to get out to that and uh, that's another one of those things where you know don't, don't, don't knock on Carol's door at 6 in the morning but you might want to come a little bit early because I find that things sell quickly with those bake sales. So. You know, don't, don't, don't push it too hard, but don't be too tardy at the same time. And then on August the 8th, we wrap up this series of fundraisers with the pork barbecue at Olivet United Church. And uh, Cindy Tai is the person to contact there. And her contact information is available on the website and on the Facebook page. And uh, I think there are some posters around and on various signs so do make contact with her and hopefully we can have a sell out there as well. So all good. I think that could be it for announcements. If not, oh right, thank you, absolutely. I'm even looking, I have a card. I will read the card, <clears throat> here we go. Dawn, your mom asked me to tell you what kind of flowers these are. They're flocks. And that's from Mary. So they are flocks. So now you know, and probably most of you knew that, but I didn't. And so rather than waffling away at, well, they're lovely flowers, they said, all right, have them tell you what they are. And I hope that you recognized Haskins Point from the picture at the front of the service on the plate as we get ready to worship together, as we continue to explore those themes of bread and water Today we have both bread and water in our reading from John as we think about those things, the basics of life, those things that provide us with life and sustain us and, and keep us and nourish us. And so that is going to be it for, for water, but then we'll move into bread for the next few weeks. And so that will be a theme of the readings of Jesus as he explores the sayings, I am the bread of life and what that means for us. So, with all of that in mind, we enter into worship this day. We take a moment to gather ourselves. We light the Christ candle. And hear these words of call written by Phil Hobbs while he was at Frankfurt, Ontario. And I know where Frankfurt is, that's north of Belleville. We gather now to worship God, kind creator, compassionate friend, ever-present spirit. We gather longing to encounter God, to experience the divine presence in sharing, in receiving, 
God's promise is to meet us here or wherever we may be this day and to go with us as we journey onward, helping us to be faithful disciples of Jesus, empowered by the Spirit in this place, in every place, and to the ends of the earth. With love and gratitude, let us worship God. And we will sing the third verse of Come and Find the Quiet Center. In the Spirit, let us travel open to each other's pain. Let our loves and fears unravel, celebrate the space we gain. There's a place for deepest dreaming, there's a time for heart to care. In the Spirit's lively scheming, there is always room to And our prayer for this morning. Is written by Carol O'Neill. Gracious God, help us to make every Sabbath, every Sunday, every quiet time about you. Still our hearts. Give rest to our souls and refocus our spirits. For true renewal comes only from you. Holy Spirit, please help us to be intentional with our time and worship and encourage us to find rest in you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Dan played this as one of the hymns, uh, the intro hymns last week, and I, I just, I heard it, and I thought, it's been too long since we have sang this hymn, have sung, have sung, sang, sung. I just, when I said sang, I immediately said sung, and thought, no, wait, sung is better than sang. Uh, we have sang, we have sung. <laughs> anyway. We're going to sing it now. It is 391, God Reveal Your Presence.
saints their voices lending. Bow your ear to us here. Hearken, O Lord Jesus, to our humble praises. O great fount of blessing, purify my spirit, trusting only in your merit. Like the holy Now that is a fun hymn to sing, is it not? Come on, I hope you really had a chance to sing that out. And what could be better than rhyming terrestrial with celestial? Isn't that a great rhyme? Right at the end, what a beautiful way to finish a hymn. Rule your church terrestrial as the host's celestial. That is awesome. That's right up there with spirit of gentleness, stir me from placidness, <laughs> spirit of restlessness. <laughs> So good, so good. This morning's uh, scripture reading is brought to you uh, by Jane Griggs. Okay. Good morning. The scripture reading this morning is from the book of John, chapter 6, reading verses 1 to 21. Jesus feeding the multitudes, the 5,000, and Jesus walking on water. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are, we going, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this test to him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who has come to the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When the evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, 
and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. Amen. <laughs> Doug Hanning, try that. <laughs> That's, that's quite the effect. Good Lord. I just turned into Jane Griggs and turned into myself again. <laughs> hang on, I need to take a minute to compose myself. Wow. Uh, as we are getting ready to hear the word and uh, in sermon form, as we have heard the word in scripture form, I invited you to consider uh, ordinary or everyday miracles, uh, things that are perhaps commonplace enough, but still if we catch them in the right moment or in the right mood, they, they move us to, to moments of awe and wonder. And it's certainly a, a popular theme. I was looking this up in, in musical terms, and there's at least three different songs that are uh, titled Ordinary Miracle or Everyday Miracles. Uh, Barbara Streisand sang one, Sarah McLaughlin has one, there's one from I think the Disney film, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and they all touch on this same idea, that there is wonder and awe in the world, and it is all around us, but sometimes it is in the very everyday and in the very ordinary. So what are some of the things that can still move you to awe? And I think Liz commented, uh, a star-filled night, you know, on a dark, dark night when you look up and you see that starry sky. And I think that's certainly one that, that moves many of us. I know rainbows have been powerful in my life. And every time I see a rainbow in the sky, um, I, I, I just want to, to stop and, and look at it and wander in it. And usually if I'm in my car, hopefully I'll pull off the road before I stop and look out the window and just catch that glory and that awesomeness. For some, it is certainly uh, birth, right? And the idea of, of, of childbirth and you hold that baby in your arms and you are just uh, stunned and amazed by, by the miracle of how this happens and, 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 and just that moment of joy is a powerful one. For myself, when I think about what moves me to wonder, there's one thing in particular since I've come to Seely's Bay, and I'd like to introduce you to him or her that has caused me wonder. Uh, they are from the um, Lampyridae family, and they're a charismatic member of the order Coleoptera. Now, its bioluminescence is the result of the enzyme luciferase acting on luciferin in the presence of magnesium ions, ATP, and oxygen. Have you figured out who my little friend is yet? Hmm? Any guesses? Bioluminescence? Luciferase? The order Coleoptera? Well, the order Coleoptera is beetles, and the Lampyridae family is lightning bugs, fireflies, those amazing little things that glow in the backyard. Now, when I was growing up, I don't know whether I just wasn't outside at night much <laughs> as a child, but when I was in Georgetown, I don't remember ever seeing them. Uh, Newcastle in the backyard, I don't remember ever seeing them. Uh, when I went to Newfoundland, they certainly weren't in the backyards in Newfoundland, but coming here, the first few summer nights that I sat in the back, that beautiful backyard at the manse here in Sealy's Bay, I just saw those little flashes, you know, and I just, ah, oh, those things are amazing. They're wondrous. You can just sit there in the night and, and relax in the warmth of a summer evening and just see all of those, those beautiful little flashes. And it's just, it's transcendent. It transports me to a place of wonder and excitement. Perhaps back to the things that I missed as a child, because I certainly heard of, uh, you know, kids catching lightning bugs in a jar, you know, and bringing that home. And I don't know, for those of you who grew up in this area, who might have been more familiar with them, you may have had the opportunity to do that. But, but just that idea of catching a little bit of living light in a bottle and hopefully letting it go again, but just having that all around you, the wonder of that. Now, when I was looking up all of this rigmarole about the scientific background of, of lightning bugs, uh, there was an interesting little fact about them, and that is that there's not a lot of study that's been done about 
fireflies. We know a little bit of, you know, obviously we know about the chemical side of things. We, we think that they flash actually to attract mates. And uh, this is probably very typical of the world, but you know, the bigger flash <laughs> attracts the bigger mate. <laughs> you know, so, so they work very hard to get those flashes nice and bright. But it also might be to warn off uh, predators, to warn off each other. Uh, they're, they're kind of bad tasting apparently, so, so not a lot of things eat them. But they're also not a threat to crops. And so they're not studied in the way that a lot of various small insects are. So not, not, an, awful lot of, not an awful lot is known about them. And uh, in fact, they are declining, according to some estimates, that, that numbers are dropping. And that might be just a side effect of some of the, the pesticides that we use or for their territories being reduced. But for whatever the reason, uh, we'd hate to think that they would disappear and people would never even have the opportunity to study them in depth. And it's often like that, that the things that, that don't uh, directly threaten us or, or help to improve our lives in some material way, those are the things that get the study, right? I mean, it's really important that we want to know everything about like boll weevils because they destroy cotton crops or we want to know about funguses or, or we want to know about the flowers that can uh, provide healing for us, you know, digitalis and things like this. We do all kinds of study on plants and animals that can provide medicines for us. But something like a lightning bug which just goes along in the world and doesn't really do much except just flash its way through life and, and bring wonder and joy is sometimes unremarked upon, unappreciated, unstudied, unreflected upon. And that's too bad, because the ordinary and the everyday, the things that we don't think about, the things that sometimes we take for granted, can be areas where we can be surprised, blown away, in fact, with awe and with wonder. And in fact, it's through some very ordinary things that Jesus does miracles in the readings that we have in Scripture for this Sunday. These are things which stop us, they bring us up short, we wonder about them, both in the sense of wondering how they could happen, but also that sense of wonder in terms of awe, that it's just such an amazing thing, that so many people gathered together could be fed, nourished by so little. Or that Jesus could walk on the surface of the water in the midst of storm, in the midst of unrest, and, and come to his disciples and be present with them, crossing a seemingly uncrossable barrier to join them, to be present with them in the boat in their time of need. So wonder comes out of the ordinary and out of the everyday. When I was a kid, I had a bit of a lonely childhood, and I hear you saying, how lonely was it? Well, as I believe I've mentioned before, it was so lonely that I would sometimes play Dungeons and Dragons by myself. And that's not easy to do, I can tell you. But I did have a lot of experience with video games. I, I loved the fantasy video games, Link and Zelda and Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy and all of these games, and they usually involved magic. You know, that you had to do something magical, you had to do something wondrous. But it, it usually involved having to get some very rare uh, thing that had a wild and unpronounceable name, and you had to go into a poison swamp to get it. You know, there was a big quest involved, and it was something like, well, it was something like out of Shakespeare. You know, you'd have those weird things like the, the claw of newt, or you'd have mandraga dragona root, or some crazy thing like that. Elixir of a snake's tears taken in a silver vial at a full moon, you know, that was the sort of thing that magic and was about, you know, to, to go somewhere exotic or to do something fantastic. It always involved something otherworldly. But if you pay attention to the miracles of Jesus, the wonders that he works, they're never to do with going way off somewhere and doing something weird. They always involve the very ordinary, the very everyday, transformed. So again, for the people who have gathered, it is simply in the loaves and the fishes that Jesus says, through the power of God, we will be provided for. That's what that miracle is saying, that, that there is enough 
for us all. Even when it seems like there is scarcity in the world, even when we wonder how on earth will all of these people be nourished with such a small amount, they are nourished. They are filled with enough left over. And in those moments of fear and uncertainty, when we think that we are separated from God, when we think that we are separated from the things that can love and support us, the water itself, so often thought of as impassable, impenetrable, we see the damage that water can do if it's not contained. Even as much as we can take it for granted sometimes on a clear and, and sun-filled and calm day, well, you know, Dave and Dan have told me a story a couple of times about how they, they just barely got back on a boat before the lightning hit, you know, and they were just getting off the boat. All of a sudden, it can be a very dangerous thing. And yet, even at that moment, Jesus crosses over on the water, that everyday thing, and is present with his disciples in the boat. He is with them. He provides them safety, reassurance. And when I think about the world that we live in, do we not sometimes take for granted that we will have food and that we will have safety? How often do, do you and I think about our safety or our food? And yet, in this world, how many are there of the billions of people who dwell on this beautiful, beautiful sphere, who do not know safety, who do not know enough for food. We understand that perhaps in Jesus' time, and, and there's some discussion about this amongst biblical scholars, but for the people who are gathered around Jesus, having a full belly was probably not a regular experience. There was a lot of hunger, there was a lot of want, particularly amongst those who might have been dwelling, you know, at a distance from the places where, where things were provided for. There were farms in the area, but often that would go to the wealthy within the city, uh, similar to situations in feudal times in Europe, where oftentimes the farmers would starve, even if they were growing all of this food, because it simply wasn't for them or even the fishermen who weren't allowed to eat their own catch. They would have to, it was beholden to others. So hunger and want was, was perhaps a real element of the time and the place where Jesus was. And speaking of safety, this was a time of many wars, of, of empires coming back and forth. The Romans were currently in power, but there had been many different empires that had come through. Jerusalem had come through the Middle East, and, and there was war between factions, even within their own peoples. So again, that idea of, of making it through a day without being threatened for your life may be a rare thing. So does that help us when we reread this and understand just how important this was, just how significant this was for the people who were trying to find out who Jesus was, to try to understand what this message was, a message of abundance, a message of peace. And yet even at that we understand and we read that they, they still didn't fully understand this kingdom because they wanted to make as the words of the hymn say, they wanted to make Jesus a terrestrial king who would exert power in the way that they understood power, through force, through might, to make him king of the people. But his kingdom was a celestial kingdom beyond those, those temporary and temporal ideas. It, it's a broader idea. It's an idea that's meant to inspire wonder and awe. It's meant to make people stop and think about the world differently. But they were still thinking about the world in those same tired old ways of thinking that we still get stuck into. Who has power? 
Who has control? Do I have enough power? Do I have enough control? I want to hold on to what I've got. I feel threatened by others who might think differently from me, who have power. All of those things were still in people's heads. They had not yet absorbed the full wonder of what Jesus was doing in those miracles to point to a different kind of kingdom. Sometimes we need to reflect on the moments that, that overwhelm us. It's not enough to just stare up at the stars and go, wow, and then walk away. Because that wow moment is trying to do something in us and through us. There's a couple of stories of people who have looked up into the starry sky. One of them was a guy named Douglas Adams who wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And he was inspired to write that whole trilogy and, and all of that wonderful and imaginative stuff just lying on his back. He was drunk, you know, but he was lying on his back in a field and looking up at the stars and just thinking about our place in the stars. You know, and, and moving us from thinking that we're in the center of the world, of the universe, to, to putting us far out in an uncharted backwater on the western spiral arm of a small and unknown galaxy. You know, he, he tries to imagine and reimagine our place <coughs> in space. It's a transformative moment of understanding where we are in the world. Bob McDonald. Same thing in his book, Measuring the Earth with a Stick. Talks about his moment of looking up in the stars and wonder and feeling the curve of the earth in his spine and wanting to write about space. He actually wanted to be an astronaut, but I guess that wasn't going to work out. So the next best thing to being an astronaut is writing about space, I guess, for CBC and for the books. But it was still an opportunity for him to to reflect on, on where the earth was and how we are exploring the space around us and what we might learn and how we might be changed. So how are we changed from seeing these miracle stories? What does that awe and wonder work in us? Do we take to heart the message that there is abundance for all? abundance of love. There's abundance of food if we could understand how better to distribute it, to, to not waste so much of it. It's there for us. And safety. Do we understand how blessed we are to live in a world in this country where it's not an everyday thing to wonder if I'm going to survive this day. And how can we change this world so that more people could understand that, could experience it, could know it? Is this not the focus of who we are as a human family, as ones who are loved by God, as ones who God calls to love others? all others as fellow children of the divine and of the holy. May you be filled with awe and wonder wherever you find it, but may it move you to make this world a better place. Amen. I hope that you know prayers of thanksgiving are a fairly regular part of your life. I, they're really important for us to think about counting our blessings, however else we may want to say it. Often that's something that we take for granted. Often I suppose that is something that if I listed all of the things that I am thankful for just in the course of a day, that would probably move me to awe and, and to wonder. And certainly this is a, a, a hymn, it's in more voices, it's out of the, the spiritual tradition. Every day is a day of thanksgiving.
good to me. Every day your blessing be, you know that every day is a day of thanksgiving. I will glorify you, O my Lord, today. Every day is a day of thanksgiving. God, you've been so good to me. Every day your blessing be, you know that I will glorify you, O my Lord, today. You keep blessing me, blessing me, blessing me. You open the door that I might see your blessing me. Blessing me, blessing me, I will glorify you, O my Lord, today. You keep blessing me, blessing me, blessing me. You open the door that I might see your blessing me, and you keep blessing me, blessing me, blessing me. I will glorify you, O my Lord, today. Thank you, Dan. Hmm. <laughs> Let us pray. God, we do give thanks for the moments of wonder and awe in our lives, the moments where we, we are overwhelmed, but, but not in a way that brings stress or fear, but in a way that brings deep appreciation and joy transformation to our hearts and to our minds. We give thanks for the miracle stories of Jesus, those moments which bring us out of every day and surprise us and encourage us and help us to see the glory and the power of your kingdom, a kingdom that cares for all, a kingdom that provides for all. A kingdom based on love and abundance, justice and goodness. Help us in our own daily living to, to take those moments and to take them into our hearts and to our minds those moments of wonder, and may they transform us. May they lead us to deeper understandings of our call as disciples, as friends of your Son, as messengers of your kingdom. 
We give thanks for all who explore this world and its mysteries, who bring us insights in medicine, in science, in history, in language, in theology, the things that we learn, which encourage us to learn even more. Help us to not take for granted the things which we sometimes miss because they just seem to be there. Not to help us or to hurt us, but, but simply to be. And yet there is wonder in such things as well. We pray as we continue to move through this pandemic season that you will continue to walk with us as, as parts of our lives reopen and as we are reconnected to family and friends in ways that we have been longing to be connected, that we will be thankful and mindful of what still needs to be done, of what precautions still need to be taken but it feels as if perhaps we are making our way with progress. We pray for those in our community who are sick, who are in hospital, who are feeling loneliness or pain. May you be a source of healing and hope for them and may you help us to be agents of that hope in our times of relationship. We continue to pray for our leaders, for those who have to make the difficult decisions in these times, that your wisdom would be their wisdom. We pray for those who are continuing to endure drought, and for those who farm crop loss. Be with them in the difficult decisions that are sometimes needed to be made. And as we are gathered this morning, hear the prayers of your peoples, our prayers of concern for ourselves and others, but also those prayers where we bring our thankfulness to you. God, hear our prayers. We pray in Jesus' name, who taught these words to us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 355 in Voices United, and it's a, a hymn which reflects on the feeding of the 5,000. For the crowd of thousands sitting on the ground, seven is sufficient, seven will go round. 355 in Voices United. <laughs> I hope that you enjoy the rest of your July because when we come to you again it will be August already so I hope that you have a safe uh, long weekend as well and uh, you will be able to worship with us once again next week August the 1st same church time same church channel but until that time may the love of God and the peace of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Oh,